this core is sort of, yeah, as somebody mentioned before, it's the main RTL implementation that, that is used by the open source community lately. Uh, the motivation behind writing it was the fact that I kind of couldn't deal with working with the OR1200 anymore. <laughs> so the OR1200 was actually, I think, literally the DLX copied from the book into a text editor <laughs> and then compiled. So the architecture was very similar. And, you know, that, that was all nice and it was, it was it wasn't it wasn't entirely clear how how you can modify it and you know make serious changes like add or remove pipeline stages, which is sort of sort of what I wanted to do. Yeah. I was quite jealous of the you know the, the Altera Neos where you could yeah. select the trade-off between uh, area and, and performance. So you know you could choose to have more gates and you know clock quicker on the pipeline or less gates, um, fewer pipeline stages, but it runs slower. So I kind of wanted that in a core, and I didn't see an easy way of achieving yeah. that in, with the OR 1200 RTL. So I thought, screw it, write my own, we'll start again, have a go at least. And so I started writing it, and the initial one was, the initial one looked a bit more like the OR 1200, but then I sort of decided maybe it's easier as well to at the same time kind of develop a, a shorter pipeline, because you know, you'd think that would make it um, less complicated. So. The implementation has a couple of pipelines which, uh, which are in it at the moment. The best supported is the one that um, has received, also, the one, the pipeline which has received the most work has been the longer, um, longer stage pipeline, faster one. Uh, in the RTL code base, there is, there is support for a shorter set of pipelines as well, which are you know, more suited for the more deeply embedded uh, range of things. Oh, very good. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah I think. So, <laughs> But uh, most of the work's gone into the Cappuccino pipeline. I gave the names of, of copies. Um, and it was also one of the first implementations, I think, which, which we were able to drop support for the delay slot on. Um, so that's sort of a short history of the core. Um, unfortunately, it's, it suffers from the same issues of the, as the OR1200 in terms of lack of documentation and you know, no, probably nowhere near uh, enough verification of it. Um, but that was also something that I tried to address with the project, you know, the lack of verification of open source RTL. Um, I tried to be strict, but, you know, <laughs> you know how these things go. Uh, so I'll, I'll cease hijacking your presentation and hand it over to Stephanie. Okay, so this is kind of a yearly thing that we have done, keep an update on what has happened with the MR1KX. And uh, last year, this is the slide from the or the last slide from last year, what what we wanted to do kind of this year or in the future. Uh, so some pipeline optimizations, moving around the multiply or like making it going along the pipeline was one thing I wanted to do, and then uh, cash associate the activity Stefan has worked on, and uh, multi-way TLDs. The store buffer, some improvements there. Currently, it's just uh, static the, the branch prediction. We want to have, have a dynamic branch prediction, multi core, also, Stefan has been working on. And uh, some optimizations like speed and area. And uh, yeah, this is kind of, we have, we have kind of. <coughs> Been doing what we have planned, even though I haven't really looked at the, this whole to-do list. But yeah, kind of a lot of things that that we wanted to do has been done. Uh, yeah, the, we have now multiplied that moves along the pipeline. There's still some problems with it. it. Introduces some critical parts, so some more work is needed there. But it at least the implementation is there, and yeah, cash is also and. Activities like uh, LRU, new uh, caches, uh, multi TLB, we haven't really done yet, but that's, that should be pretty easy to do. That's kind of one thing that I forgot about and might do in the short term future. Yeah, and this store buffer and branch prediction. They, and they, they should be pretty easy too to do, but it's like, well, no one has fun time for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I might be getting 
end of the year. Are you going to quantify any of the area improvements or performance improvements over in the last 12 months? No, I don't have any real numbers. I think like in a Spartan 6 FPJ we have something like 2.2k lots, like in a minimal uh, like bare metal without the MMU and with the MMU we have about 2,800 lots. So that's roughly like a workable, workable. And then that's now, right? That's that's yeah, that's, that's now. That's after that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we have some speed improvements, like not really much, but a couple of megahertz, like faster as it became. Like in, in the FPGA like targets, we have, I have tried it on. Yeah, and multi core we have that going on. Or like that's that's working. And uh, we had a couple of stuff that we kind of didn't know of or wasn't in the to-do list and uh, atomic instructions. We have defined that in the specification and done implementation in the RPL and also in simulators and so on. But uh, yeah, and the FPU like all of said, we have one on route, back at all. It's, it's been working on porting the whole, or, or, or 1200 FPUs to M1PX. I haven't really had time to even try it, but according to him, it's making progress and something is working. And uh, we had some improvements to the debug system, we had some bug reports about the bug system not working correctly, so I think that is pretty solid now, that, that should really work, like running it with a good debugger. And uh, yeah, shadow register files, we have that, that was kind of needed for the multi-core stuff. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Is uh, this yeah, fast context? Yeah, this stuff? is kind of part of the fast context, which but it's only a small part because it's it's kind of like huge the whole fast context definition. But from what I read from the specification, this it's kind of allowed to use only this small set of the fast context, or you can use it only the the shadow register files like read and write them with SPRs. So that's kind of another to do like actually implement the fast the whole thing. But there's, it's pretty involved, so so I'm, that's a, like a long term if ever kind of goal. But this is at least like something that works, or like something we needed for the multi core stuff, but is still aligned with the specification. We didn't need to change the spec. We could like work against the, the current spec. <coughs> why why did you need a multi core? I don't quite understand. Uh, an exception to essentially need some calculations, and you need some purchases. Yeah, like scratch base for it. Oh, I see. Because you can't use a fixed address anymore because each point is yeah. A shadow register is actually the best trade off between complexity and uh, low number of instructions for uh, context switch. I wonder if it wouldn't be easier to just have special registers that uh, allow direct transfers. So, uh, um, you have one associated with each normal register, so you would have one white bus that could allow immediate transfer over there, but you wouldn't have to have uh, full blown registers that are tied with pass pass to the other and the, the other <coughs> processor. Well, my understanding is this is you just needed extra registers in the implementation. Sorry? It is, is the whole. In the whole point of this was that you just needed additional registers to sort out. So you need yeah. at least okay. two registers or three. Okay. Yeah. Ah, right, sure. For the exception. You can't use the GPRs. Yeah. I see. Cool. This was part of the spec already, so we didn't have to update the spec. So it's like a context ID that's only used to, I think, it's eight registers. Mm, well, actually, it's 32 that, like, but we're not using them all. But it was, at least in the FPJ targets, it's like as easy to to get the whole. It just extends the the block RAM with 
where the registers are going. So it's it's kind of no extra extra. Yeah, and then some random bug fixes have of course been made too. And some stats. Made two releases. That was one thing with our 1200 too, that we never made any releases. So <coughs> I tried to actually push out some releases when I feel that it's not a like plan thing. It's like, okay, we have something that is stable enough. Like now it's a good point. Now we just do a tag in Git and do a release. And then the system that we have is that we, I backport then like bug fixes to that branch. And then we move on like in the, in the master branch with all new features. And then at some point when I feel that we have too much new stuff, I just make a new release and like the same. I, I think it has been working pretty well. But it's, it's no overhead like work to do releases. It's just when when I feel like. Uh, so how many lines total? How many lines of code? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Can I go to to in, in the rough number? Yeah, but if I can, reach, I think GitHub can show me. Ah, it's not mine. Is it not? 
whole development <coughs> environment where you had the tests like baked into that, but we have them separated in a in a separate uh, repository, GitHub. With all the, so it's basic, basically a small assembler or C. Most of them are assembler that just test some small small thing of the of the core point tests. Yeah. yeah. Cool features. Cool. Yeah. No, I saw that. There was an because you're right, we did have a bunch of the same tests copied or branched into various different SOC implementations yeah. or whatever. So, um, I, yeah, so we have, but yeah, it's kind of work in progress. Like, it's, it's not nicely set up that you just download it and you just press make tests and it works. It, it, it's not like that and we should have it like that. But, but it's kind of, with a bit, with a bit work, you can make it like a few sock made SLC, you can run the tests against that, so it, yeah, it works. So, so you don't verify the blocks independently, you just plug them in and run the, yeah. the tests? That's yeah, there's no block level tests. I think that's uh, one thing that we should yeah. do. Yeah, <laughs> I think like we should do that too, but... Yeah, it's an offer. If you think about the LSU, you might be testing this with your control input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, Probably why <laughs> well, we don't have it because yeah. someone did it. Yeah, it's kind of on a who wants to do it kind of basis. So. But having having said that, you know, we know it's a good idea. It seemed to have gotten to a point where it's pretty robust. Yeah. Why just trying to boot Linux on it? Having a few point tests. I know at some point we used to run the GCC <laughs> execution suite against it as well. Yeah, and I have run run it like against Linux too. So, all right, cool. Yeah, that's that's another source of, uh, of the test cases that we use the GCC test suite. Uh, Don't use my toolkit. Yeah. <laughs> what about the guys who have put this in commercial apps? You showed a few companies, so I assume they would have very done a little bit more verification before they manufacture stuff, right? Yeah. So, wouldn't they donate it some environments? Or? So Samsung would comply with the legal requirements to put the source of open risk. You can go and download it from their website. They don't appear to have made any changes. They took a vanilla OR 1200. And um, removed them and you basically. Yeah. Um, and so you say before they manufacture 10 million dice, they've not verified it? Oh, well, they've, I we don't know. They, have but they haven't contributed that. that they haven't like, contributed anything that or okay. told us about it. So we don't know about it. The, um, the one that the, the Zigbee chip that we know of is the NXP mm -hmm. one which they got for Genic. That was actually uh, a core that was called the, it's the the on semi, isn't it? The BA twelve one twenty core, which is based on Open Risk, um, but they spun off as a separate company, and uh, the, the relationship between them and the guys who kept on doing Open Cores wasn't necessarily always as good as it could be, and there hasn't been terribly good contribution back. They like to make a lot of in public about it being open risk design, and they they have an article about this on EE Times. And I posted a comment saying, "Great to see an open course design. Can we see the source published?" At which case, they suddenly decided it wasn't an open course design and wasn't bound by open open source um, uh, requirements. So, all right, you, you, not everyone not everyone in hardware gets the philosophy of open source and the legal obligations. But I think it's a good question, though. I mean, where have these things been manufactured? And um, I'm sure they're verified. Uh, yeah, yeah. We yeah. should at least form, do a formal verification of the FPU. I remember there was some company who did some had some bug in the FPU that uh, around '94 or something that uh, was just problematic. Don't say about the bug now, Yeah. No, it's a, it's a big thing we're missing, I think, is, is the fact that we get very, so few people in the industry using these cores, and if they do, they don't tell us. And they definitely don't share in verification. And, you know, therefore we can't say this has been you know, validated in this silicon or whatever. So I mean, another example, I mean, the, the, we have a CAN controller on open cores. We are not allowed to say that it has been tested uh, with formal requirements. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> is it actually feasible to do a formal verification or is, is it more like you just have to convince somebody else who understands this stuff that you actually compute what you're supposed to compute? Yeah, but formal verification is 
in some areas it's quite uh, it's quite uh, popular in uh, art design. And any but sort of is it feasible for something like uh, transcendent functions where you uh, mix analysis with bit bashing? Uh, you first need a framework that can actually encompass all that stuff. Yeah, it's, I mean, you, your results won't be better than your. It, it, it was only about three years ago that the first proper verification of open risk was ever done. It was the MSC student Ahmed. Yeah. And he published it, at which point we discovered there were 13 instructions that had never been implemented. And because the compiler didn't generate them, no one had noticed. So um, it's come on a huge amount in the last three years. Yeah. Everything I have to say about this.